And um, I think if these, um, if this, the work of the Indaba is going to continue, then we need an inclusive public process. I've heard the apology from the chair, and the, the apology is acknowledged, but um, um, we just wanted to register our objection um, at the way that this, this Indaba has actually been called up. Um, having said that, um, I just want to make a few introductory comments um, about the Right to Know campaign, campaign, which was established in August 2010, um, and it's had endorsements since then by over 400 organisations and 11,000 individuals. It has elected structures in all those provinces. In fact, a couple of days ago, the Eastern Cape structure was launched in, in Grahamstown. And in just over a year, um, what we can say we've achieved is we've campaigned successfully to have the Protection of Information Bill, or what's euphemistically called the Secrecy Bill, reopened for further consultation. Now, this is the campaign vision, um, which I won't read. Um, but I think um, it should give an, uh, an indication of the fact that we're also concerned about creating enabling conditions in South Africa for the free flow of information, which obviously means that we have to get into questions um, of, of, of media diversity and media transformation. That's, that's, that flows logically from our mandate. Now, the one thing we do have to just um, flag right up front is that we're still developing positions um, in this particular area. Um, we have had a summit, um, and there was a summit resolution that called for adequate and sustainable funding for community media and the MDDA, um, a rejection of statutory regulation of the print media, but it also called for measures as well to limit media concentration, and there were a number of other proposals specifically relating to broadcasting that I won't necessarily go into. Now, how do we define media transformation? Obviously, we're not going to be able to have a sensible discussion until we've got a common understanding of what we mean by transformation. And um, we found um, quite a useful definition of transformation that came out of a series of academic debates that happened in the late 1990s about um, to what extent had the media at that stage transformed. And this definition was developed by two academics, Ron Crabble and Mashina Boloka, um, who's now with the DOC. It was developed in 2000. And it goes, successful transformation will be achieved when the media reflects in its ownership, staffing, and product, the society within which it operates, not only in terms of race, but also socioeconomic status, gender, religion, sexual orientation, region, language, etc. This is only possible if access is opened, again, in ownership, staffing, and product, not only to the emerging black elite, but also to grassroots communities of all colors. And we're using that as a guiding definition to assess to which, uh, the extent to which the media um, have actually transformed. Now, there's also, um, before we get into that assessment, there's a number of preliminary remarks um, that we'd like to make. Firstly, I think there can be little doubt that newspapers are largely on the cutting edge of journalism in South Africa. Most of the really significant investigative stories of the past few years have been broken by newspapers. Most of the awards for excellence in journalism have also gone to newspaper journalists. Now, one of the reasons why um, why this has happened is because the major newspaper groups have reinvested in investigative journalism capacity. Now, this kind of journalism should be recognized and celebrated as an essential pillar of democracy. We must defend the space for newspapers to continue to do this work on pure democratic grounds. Now, having said that, it's also necessary for us to assess the extent of transformation of the industry. And I think we need to do so dispassionately, which may be <coughs> difficult in this current climate, because there's obviously quite a lot of emotion about this particular, around this particular issue. And this is because media freedom and media transformation for us are two sides of the same coin. 
Without media freedom, the media will be untransformed as it will become the voice of the state or even the ruling party. But without media transformation, media freedom will become the freedom enjoyed by the few. So for us, we need to pay attention to media freedom and media transformation in equal measure as they are inter inter interdependent concepts. Now, just in terms of the question of media diversity and the, the extent to which the newspaper industry is concentrated, there was a period in the late 1990s when the print media began to diversify quite significantly. Whole new layers of owners were introduced, including um, black empowerment groups, trade unions, and women's groups. There was significant transformation on the level of staffing and audiences. But in the early 2000s, the print media started to reconsolidate. And we now have a situation where one large group dominates, which is Media 24, NASPAS, followed by three smaller groups. These are the circulation figures um, from the NDDA report, apologies, <laughs> slightly out of date. But that should give you an indication of, um, of where we stand with regards to um, uh, control of, of total newspaper circulation. Now newspapers are spread unevenly across the country. They tend to publish largely in English and to a lesser extent in Afrikaans, with the possible exception of the tabloids. Now this means that upper working class and middle class audiences are prioritized in the main now these are some of the transformation challenges that we obviously need to grapple with in the next two days. Now South Africa's newspaper market is clearly not as concentrated as Australia's, where two groups dominate 90% of the market. But the South African market is very da veering dangerously towards excessively high levels of concentration. And the dominance of Media 24 should be of particular concern. Now, why should we be concerned? We should be concerned for democratic reasons. <coughs> Concentration can lead to the following. It can lead to a reduction in the plurality of media outlets and diversity of opinion. The homogenization of media content. The prioritization of views in the elite minority. And the dominance of commercial interests over the public interest. We need to be concerned about these things. Think about it for a minute. What if at some stage in the future, Media 24 decided to sell it to newspapers? And the Murdoch group decided to buy them? We'll be in trouble. Now, just reflecting on some of the arguments that have been made in media policy circles about how to measure excessively high levels of concentration. Um, there's obviously a lot of disagreement about this particular point. So for instance, um, some countries have developed a number of voices test or a diversity point system. Um, there's also been an argument that if one group owns more than 25% of the market, then it should be considered excessively concentrated. Alternatively, um, and, uh, media economics theorist Eli Nome have suggested that a market with fewer than four voices for the market share of 20% each should be considered concentrated. France, for instance, has legislated um, against excessive concentration and it has legislation that prevents ownership of more than 30% of circulation. And I think it's these kinds of things that you as legislators need to debate. How do we define an excessive level of concentration? Um, the further point that I'd like to make as well is that it's perfectly permissible on democratic grounds 
for legislators to intervene in media ownership levels to ensure diversity, as this creates an enabling environment for the exercise of freedom of expression. Legislators can do this, but it is not permissible on democratic grounds to control media content. This is something that legislators cannot do on constitutional grounds. Now, we'd just like to make a couple of points about um, the extent of um, uh, print media groups compliance with um, the triple B, double E scorecards. Um, now, just doing an overview of the seven elements of the triple B, double E scorecard, it's evident that the performance of the industry is patchy. There's a book chapter that we've distributed on the state of print media transformation, and there's a table in there that compares and contrasts the scorecards of the different um, media groups. Um, so the detailed analysis is there. Now, if one takes level three, to be the threshold for what one considers to be fair performance in terms of the scorecard. Only Avusa meets the target. The other groups are either level four or level five contributors. Two of the four groups are entirely white owned. All of the groups have scored extremely well on enterprise development and socioeconomic development. But the performance on employment equity is patchy are generally poor on skills development. But at the same time, um, uh, the scores are generally strong on management and control. Now, these, um, um, this performance could lead one to argue that the industry is largely black controlled as the major companies are management controlled. So black people control policy and operational issues in these companies. But it could also be argued that the allocative control exercised by shareholders may be even more fundamental to the long-term direction of the company than operational control, as the shareholders have the power to remove the directors if they do not act in the company's best interests. So in other words, this does not remove the problem of, um, of white ownership um, in the industry. And the problem remains just that, a problem and needs to be addressed for democratic reasons. Now in relation to content transformation, um, the, the triple B, double E scorecards are obviously generic measurement tools and are unable able to speak to the complexity of transformation challenges in newspaper organizations, especially on the all-important level of editorial content. So scorecards can only give us part of the picture. Now, I spoke earlier about the newspaper group's reinvestment in investigative journalism capacity. Now, this suggests a renewed commitment on the part of newspaper groups to reinvest in quality content. But there are other trends as well, um, particularly in the wake of the global recession, that are impacting negatively on media diversity as a component of transformation. So for instance, we've seen a centralization of newsrooms to reduce costs. Um, a retrenchment of staff, including editorial staff. This has led journalists um, to be under tremendous <coughs> pressure um, in newsrooms because they've been forced to do more with less. We're seeing the repurposing of content for multiple platforms, an increasing reliance on news agency copy, and Media Tenor has done some work on this particular issue. Also, and this came out in the um, report um, commissioned by the Sunday Times into editorial weaknesses um, in the newspaper in 2008, top-heavy organizational structures with a lack of investment in news generation 
And certainly in that case, it allowed um, key checks and balances to lapse. Also, in some cases, we've seen a migration of papers towards upper LSMs to tap into more economically viable audiences. So, if one could generalize, <coughs> while the groups are investing in investigative centers of excellence, at times, the rest of the newsroom is being cut to the bare bones. And these trends are impacting negatively on diversity of viewpoints in the affected publications. Now we just want to make some remarks on the state of the community and small commercial um, print sector. Because for us, there's real cause for concern there. Now in spite of the fact that newspapers are said to be dying, there's a real energy into in the sector and potentially it could blossom into something very significant so for example in eastern cape um, i learned quite recently of a network of papers 16 papers that's publishing in isitosa in pumalanga and Limpopo, we're seeing an efflorescence of grassroots papers springing up but it also seems fair to say that there's also a dark cloud that's hanging over the sector. And we've heard from the AIP um, that um, they have lost a lot of members um, recently, particularly in the wake of the global recession. Now they've attributed that um, in 2010 to shrinking advertising revenues and rising production costs. But also, a key aggravating factor um, has been the inability to compete with the big four groups, especially Caxton and Media24, that are particularly active in the community newspaper sector. These groups enjoy competitive advantages because they are vertically and horizontally integrated and they command the lion's share of advertising, especially national advertising, making barriers to entry extremely difficult for these groups. Now we think that the committee needs to pay particular attention to these problems and what to do about them. Now there's a deep sense of grievance that we've come to learn about amongst these community and small commercial newspapers about what they perceive to be the unfair competitive environment. Now rightfully, the competition authorities are the correct fora to deal with these problems. But these groups experience problems even when they attempt to take cases to the competition tribunal and the commission. Now, one of the problems that they experience is that it's difficult for small media to stay the course when they take a complaint. By the time a case is investigated, the paper may have already closed. And a case in point is a particular newspaper in Valcom, um, whose case is being investigated at the moment by the Competition Commission, um, but it's already closed. Um, also, it's difficult to afford the legal fees to continue with the case, while the larger groups have deep pockets and can therefore outlawyer the smaller But there's also more substantial problems with relying on competition law to realize diversity. And here I just want to reflect on some of the debates that are taking place international, internationally amongst media activists and media policy makers um, around the adequacy of competition law in realizing media diversity. Um, we obviously haven't taken positions on this particular issue, but I just want to reflect some of the debates that are going on. 
Now, one of the points that's made is that competition law is often not very effective in addressing social concerns in the media, such as the negative democratic effects of a group being able to dominate public opinion and the impact that this has on the democratic process. This is because competition law applies economic criteria to assess the negative effects of dominance rather than social criteria. <coughs> also, competition authorities would consider abuse of dominance to be socially detrimental, whereas media activists would consider dominance per se to be socially detrimental. Also, measures, measurements of dominance in the economy generally and in the media will probably differ because of the peculiar need of the media sector for plurality. Now, a key discussion point for Parliament should be whether it should rather consider a media-specific competition and anti-concentration law rather than relying on competition law to achieve diversity redistributed to further society. In conclusion, for us, um, on the triple B, double E scorecard, inadequate. Transformation cannot be used to triple B, double E, which we started out with, strongly implies that a media-specific diversity measurement tool is needed. We are unable to make authoritative statements about how concentrated the media action, whose voices dominate, crowded out. And the last point is SEPA. The ANS has supported a policy in bio development and diversity. And this, with the efforts of the media sector in the late 90s and the early, led to the establishment. But the reality remains underfunded. key point that we'd like to make is the environment that focuses as the main method in diversity while leaving the basic markets is going to be better, has led to a media environment, insufficient spaces, voices of women, and for a space gives more, and for a media that gives more to middle class and centrist viewpoints. This is a problem that exists not only in the broadcast industry as well. I think as we grapple with the question of transformers actually transformed, I think we need a media environment, not just the news, a build up, um, a extent we actually have if we don't look at the multiplicity of platforms in the system. And this in Dava, I think when we think of fresh to achieve diversity and how well working. The point that we'd like to make is that this point and should allow South Africans in what kind of media system they would like to see.